Welcome to the Becoming Superhuman Podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to bring you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. This episode is brought to you by my all new Super Learner Academy, the home not only of the all new Become a Super Learner 2.0, but also of my exclusive master classes and audiobooks, digital books, and tons of exclusive content only available to members of my master classes or my master class bundle, where you can purchase multiple courses and save a ton on getting all of that great content. So to check it out and to see all this amazing new content that we've recorded exclusively for Super Learner Academy, visit becomeasuperlearner.com and use the coupon code podcast to save. Greetings, super friends, and welcome, 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 welcome to this week's show. This week, we are joined by yet another interesting fellow that I met at the Summit at Sea conference at the end of last year, and I met him because there was a ton of buzz all throughout the ship about this mysterious black goopy product called Hanna One. And after hearing enough celebrities and pro athletes talking about how awesome this product was, I actually had the great fortune of connecting with the founder and CEO and learning about his product. And we started chatting, we started hanging out, and we spent the next few days getting to know one one another and sharing common interests. Now, in this episode, I finally managed to get him on the show after his prolific touring about India and working on his product and managed to get him to talk to us about Ayurvedic medicine and healing and how he developed the superfood product that I've been enjoying so much along with these experts in India. We also talk about his journey from recovering from a very severe biking accident all the way to how he transitioned from the life of a hedge fund manager to someone who works on wellness products and even his company's mission and why he thinks Ayurveda and yoga and meditation are such an important part of a balanced life. All in all, I think you'll see that he's just such an energetic person, so full of life and so full of wisdom and gratitude. I know you're going to enjoy speaking and listening to him as much as I did. And so without any further ado, I'd like to present to you my friend, Mr. Joel Einhorn. Mr. Joel Einhorn, welcome to the show, my friend. It is so good to have you here. I've definitely missed our powwow since Summit at Sea. Yeah, man. Good to be here. How are you doing? Very well. You've been a, a busy, busy man. I can tell from Facebook you've been all over India. How are you feeling? Yeah, a little jet lagged after the 26-hour flight back, but uh, all in all, pretty good. Awesome, man. Awesome. So, Joel, I've had the great privilege of getting to know you and spending time with you, you know, at Summit and on the cruise ship and all that great stuff. But for those who didn't have that awesome privilege, can you tell us a bit about your journey, who you are, who the heck are you, man? And uh, how did you get to where you are today? Well, yeah, that was uh, a great time on the boat. It was a good little workout we had there. It was pretty fun. Indeed. Well, it's been a pretty interesting journey. Basically, I'm living right now in between Venice and San Francisco. I was born in Chicago, and I was thrown into the film industry at a young age. I was heavily into sports like baseball, skateboarding, and golf. And I started my first business at the age of 12, re-gripping golf clubs. Cool. Yeah. I went to University of Illinois playing golf. And then I decided to do a semester abroad in Austria. And after basically first setting foot in Austria, I realized I probably would never come back and study in the States. It was just too good. And a lot of opportunity there. This was in 1996. So I was studying at the Vienna School of Economics, studying finance. And I decided to stay and got a job in corporate finance straight out of university And immediately thereafter, I was sent to Prague, where I worked on the first private placement in the Czech Republic for what is now AVG Technologies. It's a New York Stock Exchange company. Mm -hmm. We did pretty well there. And I decided to get out of the 
12 hour work day uh, very quickly. And I decided to start my own fund after that deal was done. So this was about 1997 and Czech Republic was obviously in a big up and coming place with a lot of opportunities. So we did many different companies. We had a clothing company. We did a art gallery slash nightclub, a restaurant delivery company, and I had a sport nutrition company. And this was all while I was also getting back into the film industry. So with all of these companies sort of running in the background, I was sort of overseeing them. I had a small production company and I was working as a utility sort of stand in and stuntman in my spare time. Mm hmm. I worked on Mission Impossible with Tom Cruise. I worked with Brad Pitt and a couple of other sort of big actors and also did a little bit of acting work myself. So sort of that was always running in the background. And at this time, I was also doing Ironman triathlons and long distance mountain bike races oh, wow. and a little bit of snowboarding. So busy guy. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, in order to sort of maintain all of these things, you know, the first thing that was really very important was to stay healthy mm -hmm. when you're working, you know, 16 to 17 hour days on set or, you know, you're training for Ironman, you know, food and supplements, you know, played a huge role in my life. So that's basically the big picture of where I am right now. Right. And I remember you telling me that you had a pretty severe injury around about that time, which was kind of really a, a pivotal turning point in your life. Tell me a bit about that. Okay. Well, seven years ago, I had a bike accident while I was training for one of these races and um, basically went straight over the bars, hit my head really hard. Uh, the helmet saved my life and shoulder, the AC joint completely dislocated. The collarbone was sticking out of my back. Oh, wow. And then, you know, a whole slew of other just sort of superficial injuries on the wrists and on the legs and went to the hospital, you know, was in the hospital for about a week and came out after the surgery, after the swelling had subsided. And I had such a bad concussion that I couldn't sleep. I had vertigo. I was spinning. And, you know, after seven days of dealing with that type of injury and having a surgery and coming out of the surgery, you can imagine what it's like not to be able to sleep and not even, I mean, it was really hard to even be able to lay down. So it was pretty much a hellish experience where I didn't even know if I would ever be normal again, which, you know, that can really sort of change your whole perspective on life, you know? So it was in this time that I just totally by chance ran into an Indian Ayurvedic doctor by the name of Dr. George Essay. And after a couple of days with him, everything had subsided. I was able to sleep again. And he had really sort of calmed down all of the, uh, let's call it the fire that was incited by the trauma of this accident. Wow. So yeah, you know, that was pretty much a life changing experience. And Dr. George and I became very, very close friends. He was just an amazing person. And after having this type of experience with him, I obviously went back to him and said, OK, well, you know, thank you very much for bringing me back to, you know, feeling like a normal human being again. Now, let's really focus on like healing the shoulder because I had pins. The only way they were able to put the clavicle back in place was by putting a, a bunch of pins underneath, uh, well, in between the skin, you know, and like sort of piercing uh, all the ligaments there and, and holding it back in place. So. Yeah, basically, we got on a, a regimen of herbs and a diet regimen, and I healed myself in, in 60 days as compared to, you know, the 90 days that they were saying. And I had the pins out of my shoulder 60 days later, and I was doing, like, light push-ups wow. after 65 days. So wow. that was sort of my introduction into Ayurveda, and it was sort of at that time where I was like, well, I would be really stupid to not use this as a – this is a huge sign – I've been given a gift, you know, I, now I have my health back. So it's something that I, it just came really naturally to really want to learn a whole lot more about Ayurveda and what was actually happening with all these herbs. That's incredible because, you know, when you and I first met, it was in the middle of a, a pretty intense workout on the ship. And, uh, you know, I think you and I were doing burpees together at the yeah. time. And, you know, I've seen you move and I've seen a lot of people move and I know a fair bit about movement. And I mean, you're completely functional in your joints, which is incredible. I would have never assumed that you'd had shoulder injuries, wrist injuries, any of that kind of stuff. So I guess the next question is, you know, we've talked on the show about yoga. We've talked on the show about 
meditation, we have never talked about Ayurveda. So tell our audience a little bit about what that means and where that comes from. All right. Well, I'll try to give you a very brief overview of Ayurveda. So Ayurveda was part of the ancient Indian Vedic texts, which are very interesting to read if you haven't ever read them. The word Ayurveda translates from Sanskrit, Ayur meaning science and Veda meaning life. So the science of life and its estimates are between five and 7,000 years old. Wow. And the basic principles of Ayurveda deal with a natural way of living a healthy life, using everything around you to live the healthiest and most, let's call it ideal life you possibly can. What they say in Ayurveda is that every human being is a unique combination of five elements, earth, water, fire, air, and space. And so we're all part of that world, but at different levels. And there's three vital life forces, which are vada, pita, and kapha. So that's vada is wind, pita is fire, kapha is earth. So those are the three doshas. Everybody is either vata, pita, or kapha predominant, but we have all three of those. And the balance of these three forces is the answer to keeping yourself fit and healthy. So when you are unhealthy, you are out of balance. You're too far out of balance with either your vata, your pita, your kapha. So it's a very easy way of looking at health. And they've, it's just a way that they've they figured out thousands and thousands of years ago. That's beautiful. I think it's beautiful how you have learned and educated yourself so much about this coming from, you know, the Western perspective and really you can tell the reverence and respect that you have for it. Yeah, I think it's great to, you know, the mixture of the the Western and the Eastern medicine, I think is, you know, that's obviously where we're headed. Yeah, absolutely. uh, We've had so many guests on the show talk about meditation and yoga and time and time again, the message that comes up is, you know, the ancients got it right. And Thousands of studies have talked about the the validity of meditation, the validity of yoga. You know, I know neither you nor I are medical researchers, but are you aware of kind of any studies that talk about Ayurveda and kind of its validity and how it's being received in the scientific community? Well, absolutely. I mean, I'll give you one example. Well, first of all, it's important to note that like yoga and meditation are, are also a huge part of an Ayurvedic way of life. Uh-huh. So as you know, there's been a lot of studies on meditation actually changing the gray matter in the brain and, you know, having the ability to do that. I'll give you one example of Ayurveda and how modern science is proving it right is turmeric and the curcumin, which is in turmeric. Obviously, you've probably heard a lot about the great benefits of turmeric. Sure. Well, in Ayurvedic cooking and also in a lot of the Rasayana, the mixtures, the Ayurvedic sort of tonic mixtures, they mix turmeric with black pepper. And they've always done this. Now, it's interesting to note that modern science has just figured out that when you mix turmeric with black pepper, it increases the bioavailability of the turmeric by 2000%. Wow, that's cool. I love stuff like that. And they've been doing this for, again, for 5,000 years. So it really makes you question where all of this information actually came from and how they downloaded it. It's pretty amazing. That's so cool, Joel. And I remember, you know, the first time I ever heard the term Ayurveda, I was actually in Rishikesh. And, you know, they mentioned it as, you know, yoga, meditation, Ayurveda. And I was like, wait, what's that third one? You know, they explained to me yoga tells you how to kind of maintain the body. Meditation tells you how to maintain the mind. And then Ayurveda tells you the specific manuals for how to live. So ideas like when should you eat breakfast? When is the healthy time to engage in sexual intercourse? How many times should you eat a day? Things like that. And also what should you eat? So I think that's really, really interesting. You know, you mentioned turmeric and uh, curcurum, and I want to shift gears a little bit to talk about Hanna One, which is your product. And mm-hmm. tell the audience a little bit the story of how I discovered Hanna One, which is I was stepping into the men's room before this lecture that was going to be given by Jimmy Chin and Stephen Kotler. And I didn't recognize either of those folks, but they were talking about this product. And Jimmy comes in with this jar and he's telling Stephen, yeah, you got to try this stuff. It's amazing. And he puts it on the counter and then goes to use the restroom. 
And, you know, I'm looking at this sitting on the counter. I'm like, is this what you guys are talking about? He goes, yeah, this stuff's incredible. It gives you so much energy. As people at Summit do, I didn't really ask who they were, but then the both of them walked up on stage and talked about, you know, scaling the shark fan and how it's so much harder than Everest. And it's like, wow, that's really cool. And then you and I met, uh, you know, a few hours later. So tell us a bit about Hannah One and the story of how that came about. You know, I've been enjoying it myself, but tell our audience what it does and what it's intended for. Great. So after the bike accident, I got straight back into training and I was using, when you're doing 20 hours of training a week, you have to take some sort of supplements. It's just impossible to eat a pound of steak and beans every day. So you have to take some sort of supplements. And I was noticing that as I was coming off of the injury, using all of these different herbs, that not only were they amazing for the healing, but they were doing things like increasing my memory recall I had more energy, I had more focus and more clarity. And, you know, living in Europe, I was speaking a couple of different languages. So, you know, when I wasn't speaking English, it would be really hard for me to have a conversation like I'm having right now. You just lose a couple of those like key sort of connecting words. And these herbs were triggering, for example, memory recall. And, and and not only that, they were amazing for, I would just call it horsepower on the bike or in running or in swimming. I had more horsepower, I had more energy and it wasn't like a caffeinated energy. It was more, again, horsepower would be the best way of describing it. So I started mixing all kinds of different herbs together. And I was working closely with Dr. George S.A., who lived in Prague. And he was the Indian Ayurvedic doctor that helped me through the injury. And I started mixing all of these herbs together. And they were great for recovery. They were great for rejuvenation. They were great for focus and energy. And I started talking to him about mixing like you know 15 or 16 different herbs that I was ordering from wherever I could find them. And it became a little bit of a problem. You know, when you're sending a kilo of white and brown powders over mm-hmm. you know, around the world, that became a little bit of a problem. So I, and I was telling him what I was mixing up and he then introduced me to Dr. Venugopal in India. And this was about four years ago. Mm-hmm. And I started talking to him about mixing products not only for sport, but for a couple of the newer variables that have been and are being thrown into our lives. Things like fluoride in the water, chlorine in water, a lot of these sort of chemicals that are coming into our systems, uh, radiation, electromagnetic radiation from cell phones and from all of these flights that we're taking and, and you know, air pollution, a couple of these new variables that haven't been around for thousands of years. And so I wanted to create a product. Basically, I wanted to have the way I envisioned it was one bag of herbs or one jar where I could just take a big scoop of it, throw it to some hot water and then just sort of chug it down. Mm-hmm. And I was looking at creating something like this. And he then mentioned to me that in India, for 5,000 years, they've had this recipe. There's these different recipes and they're called uh, Rasayanas. And what a Rasayana is, is it's a proprietary mix of herbs, very similar to what I was doing. But they put those herbs in honey, ghee, sesame oil, and raw sugar cane. Mm. And they mix them in that base. And that base is used as the transport system for these herbs. The problem is, is when you take a lot of herbs, your stomach will digest them before they actually have an opportunity to be absorbed. So that is why they use the ghee, the sesame oil and the honey and the raw sugar cane. Uh So we started working on this concept of what HANA One is now. And it was basically something just for myself and for my friends. I just wanted to have something I could take around with me because I was sort of, you know, a little bit sick and tired of taking around like an extra bag full of supplements everywhere I went. And so that was sort of the impetus for HANA One. And now what HANA One has become is it's a proprietary blend of 30 wild harvested herbs. So it's in that base of organic honey, Ayurvedic ghee, sesame oil for optimal absorption. And it contains a whole slew of anti-aging, immunity boosting ingredients like turmeric, shatavari, ashwagandha, and amalaki, which are sort of some of the more favorite and famous ones right now. Got it. Interesting. Okay. I have so many questions for you. (laughs) Cause like I said, I've been taking this stuff and I have noticed the energy effects. I've also noticed some of the pleasant side effects that you and I described for the (laughs) gentlemen. (laughs) So first question, how does this stuff work and, and what's it supposed to do? I mean, I know 
okay, for example, turmeric, right? Huge anti-inflammatory, huge on antioxidants, just reduces systemic inflammation. You know, ghee probably mm-hmm. helps with insulin regulation. It's a good, high quality fat. Mm-hmm. The rest of the stuff on, the, okay, also cinnamon. I know cinnamon. Also, right. huge <laughs> antioxidant. The rest of the stuff on this list, I remember Jimmy handing me the uh, bottle and saying, you probably don't recognize on anything on here. And I was like, no, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in the health space. I probably recognize most. Of it. And then I look at it. I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I don't know what any of this stuff is or what any of it does. So <laughs> tell us a little bit about some of the more prominent ingredients. I know we can't go through all 32, but, you know, what does ashwagandha do? What is, uh, you know, all this stuff? Okay, well, ashwagandha is, I would have to say, my favorite herb in Ayurveda. Yeah, it's considered to be a magical herb, nature's gift to mankind, and they've used it to treat people for day-to-day woes, such as stress, anxiety, exhaustion, lack of sleep, and, and many other things. It contains an abundance of antioxidants, iron, amino acids, and it's considered to be one of the most powerful herbs in Ayurvedic healing. One thing that's very interesting about ashwagandha is that it energizes and calms at the same time, which is something that's very foreign to the Western mentality. The way that the West approaches things is kind of that caffeinated mentality where it's either, you know, full on energy or kind of crashing exhaustion. And it's also something that yoga kind of sort of brings to a human being, which is, you know, you feel energized, but you also feel very calm in your decision making process. And so that's what's pretty special about ashwagandha. And it's great for athletes. It's again, that's the horsepower. So that's pretty prevalent in Hana one. Turmeric is the big one. And as you mentioned, anti-inflammatory, it helps with weight management, helps with losing excess fat, it aids in digestion, enhances liver function, it's great for the stomach. And again, when mixed with pepper, so piperin, the compound in pepper, uh, it increases the bioavailability of the curcumin, the curcuminoids, by 2,000%. Wow. And both of those products are in Hana One. And it's also important to know that you can dissect every single ingredient in the product. But as I was working with Dr. Venugopal, he really made it clear that it's the sum of all of the herbs is greater than any single part. And the whole point is that they all work together to create a greater effect. So that's really sort of where we're coming from with this product is it's everything is working together. And right. it's a, a tri-dosha product that everybody, there are no contraindications. There are no uh, stimulants in it. Everybody can take it. And uh, it's a food. It's better to think of it more as a food rather than a supplement. Right. And, you know, I was actually going to kind of poke fun at you and say, when's the paleo version coming out without the cane sugar? But then I read on your website right. that it actually only has three grams of sugar. So surprisingly, you know, when someone says it's 32 different kinds of herbs, I've handed a, a lot of packets right. to a lot of my friends over the last few weeks and they kind of look at it and they're like, oh, I don't know about this. But almost everybody loves the taste, myself included. I look at it almost as like a treat every morning. <laughs> well, that's good. It's definitely polarizing. It's not for everybody. And another interesting thing about Ayurveda is uh, I remember when I had my injury, Dr. George gave me a bag of tea. I mean, it was a half a kilo of tea. And he said, you know, drink this three times a day until it starts tasting bad or <laughs> an easier way of putting that in. until it stops tasting good. You should drink it. And if it tastes good to you, that's a good thing. I've been using it for a year and a half now, and it's still the taste is still pleasant to me, mm. which is good. And we are obviously continuing to work on the taste. But as it is a wild harvested product from India, there are certain issues with keeping a consistent taste. And you know, we don't use any preservatives or anything like that. So the fact that you do like the taste is definitely a huge added plus. Yeah. Now, is that for a second product, the tea, or that's, you know, the similar ingredients that are in Hena One? Well, the tea, I was just mentioning that because uh, as an example as to how 
in Ayurveda, the taste is important. If it tastes good to you, you should continue to eat it. You should continue to taste it, follow your desires. But we are working on an, another product, which is it's more of a water than a tea, mm. but it will come in, in tea bags. And the idea is that you know, when you're drinking your four liters of water a day, you would sort of boil a big pot of water and then put a tea bag into it and then use that like sort of herbalized water throughout the day. It's something that they do at the Ayurvedic treatment centers in India. And as I was just there and, you know, I spent 16 days in treatment, the only water you drink is this. It's a very lightly herbal water that's kind of warm and it's really, really good. So it's, it's something that we're looking at and bringing here to the West. That's awesome. I want to ask you another question, Joel, which is I have uh, two friends on my Facebook feed who incessantly post about cows. <laughs> One of them is Rob Wolf. Yeah. He's always posting about, you know, grass-fed cows. The other one is you. <laughs> right. Tell me about these magical special cows that you're always posing with. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, in Kerala, India, so in the south of India, there is a cow that's called the Vetchur. That's V-E-C-H-U-R. You can go check them out. I know it's going to sound unbelievable. But <laughs> they are a midget, uh, dwarfed, however, what's the proper nomenclature? I don't know. Um, I believe dwarf is vertically politically challenged. correct <laughs> in the cow <laughs> nomenclature. It's a vertically challenged cow. <laughs> and they've been around for thousands of years in Kerala. And... Every household used to have one of these really small cows. They're very much, their demeanor is like a dog. They're very loyal to family members. They are very suspicious of anybody outside. And they're very small. Now, they only give about a liter to two liters of milk every day. So over the course of the last couple of hundred years, the families have been uh, breeding them out in favor of larger cow breeds like Holsteins that will give you more milk. Mm. Now, this has been a huge problem in Kerala because they've almost gone extinct and they're on the endangered species list right now. They're estimating there's only 300 of these cows left. And one thing that is very special about this breed of cow is that their milk is... Now, they're doing a lot of studies into this right now. It's just sort of coming to the surface. But one thing about the cows, it, I don't know if you've heard of A2, A1 and A2 milk. Have you heard anything about this? I have not. Well, it'll be something to keep an eye out for because there's a, A1 milk is basically like 75% of the cows, for example, in the States. And then there's A2 milk. And A2 milk, it means that the fat molecules are much smaller than the standard beta cassian A1 milk, which makes the milk much more easily assimilated. And the ghee that comes from this milk is used as a transport vehicle in HANA 1 and also as a brain tonic. So what we have decided to do is to step in and find all the major players with regard to these small cows in Kerala. We just met with Dr. Sosama from the Veterinary College. She's the ex-director and the person who put together the Vetur Conservation Trust, which she's basically the one responsible for saving the, the Vetur breed. Now at the Vetur Conservation Trust at the Veterinary College, there's 150 of these cows and they're all under one roof and they're looked after uh, by the college. And so we, we went to visit the university as well. And we actually bought one. So Hana is now the proud owner of one little mature cow. What's his or her name? Her name, I assume? Her name is Narayani. So Narayana is a Hindu god. And Narayani is the female version of that name. So that's, uh, that that's our, first, cool. our first cow. Yeah, so we're doing you know whatever we can to help to save these cows. We really feel strongly about that, and we you know it's also these animals and these herbs are here for a reason, and somebody has to make sure that these traditions don't die. And there are a few people out there doing this, but I think it's you know now you're seeing a lot of people stepping up and getting involved and making sure that these things they stay here with us on this planet. I think it's very important. That is fantastic. Although I do understand that Hanna One's a pretty limited edition product just because of the quantity of this ghee. I mean, 
you've said, you know, it's not for everybody. How much can you produce it? And at what point do you need to, you know, say enough? That's all that can be made. That's all the cows there are in the world. So right now we're actually using small amount of the Vetura ghee and there are other cows that also have the A2 profile milk in India. So, so we're sourcing it from a few different places, the Ayurvedic ghee. Awesome. In terms of the numbers, that's why we run a subscription model at the moment and we're doing our best to make sure that we can ramp up and we can meet the demand. But awesome. the reason why we are doing the subscription model is so that we can ensure that everybody who actually subscribes can get the product. That's awesome. And so that's one of the things I was just working on in India is making sure that we can source the herbs uh, during the monsoon season as well as the dry season because obviously when it's raining, it's really hard to get your hands on this type of quantity of herbs. So we have a couple of different sources, one in Kerala, which is you know sort of southwest India. And then during the monsoon, there's the Western Ghat, which is the huge mountain range that runs in between Tamil Nadu and Kerala. So we have sources there to get the herbs. That's so I think we'll definitely be able to, to meet the demand, but obviously you know, we don't do too much advertising. We just, it's sort of word of mouth at the moment and we need to keep it that way so we can really sort of control the ramp up of, you know, how many people are exposed to the product and, and sure. how much we can actually supply. Sure. Let me ask this, who is the product for and who is it definitely not for? Well, the product is designed as a product for everybody. So anybody can take it. It has no contraindications. It's, you know, our doctor now is actually, he has an Ayurvedic hospital as well in Kerala, and he is prescribing it to everybody. That's I mean, right. people with MS, people with Hashimoto's disease, people coming off of chemotherapy, as well as he's giving it to his granddaughter, who's seven years old, who was having uh, some slight health problems, and then pretty much everybody in between. And that's how we did design it. We designed it to be a tri dosha product that can be taken by everybody and with no contraindications. I love that. And you know, it's kind of one of the beauties we had. I don't know if you remember Taro, the Socalpila, which you and I sat down for drinks oh, yeah. with him. And, you know, we were talking about how mushrooms are used in so many pharmaceuticals and so on and so forth. And one of the things I took away from both his interview and your interview is, you know, when you use all natural ingredients, you don't really have to worry so much about counterindications. You can say like, look, fish oil, pretty much good for everybody unless you have some very, very weird conditions. Magnesium, you know, natural ingredient, pretty much safe and good for everybody unless you have some really, really weird, you know, uh, kind of condition. I think the same yeah. goes for your products. I think the same goes for his products. And it's, it's just nice to hear that, you know, because so many times we talk about other substances and other drugs, you know, SSRIs and all these prescription medications that are like, don't take if you have this, 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 or this, or if you're taking this or this or this. So that's really refreshing that it's like, hey, there's nothing dangerous in this product. Yeah, exactly. All natural foods. Let me ask you this, Joel, what are some other key takeaways that you've picked up in your study of Ayurveda? Mm -hmm. I would say the most powerful takeaway from Ayurveda is preventative medicine. That would definitely be my number one. I mean, putting in a little bit of time every day to focus on yoga, meditation, sport, play, good eating, and you know, making those conscious decisions during your day, I feel will definitely you know, pay off in the long run. And for me, it's always been sort of a pay it forward type of deal as I don't really have any plans on spending any time in a hospital. <laughs> I would definitely say it would be preventative. And I also think that um, one thing that I'm still you know, picking up and it'll be a lifelong process is the mind, body and spirit connection, which is something that's been extremely important in my life. It's really interesting to watch how the West is finding its entry point into something like Ayurveda and yoga and meditation. And in the West, we are very focused on the body. And yoga, as you probably know, you lived on the West Coast, is, I mean, every yoga studio is pretty much focused on the body. Right. 
it's that body connection that gets people into a yoga class. And then what happens is that they realize that after they do a yoga class, they also feel amazing in their mind and in their spirit. Again, that usually comes from that calm and energized effect, right. which it's not spoken much about unless you are in these yoga circles. So for most people, if you tell them that you can be energized and calm at the same time, you know, they'd ask you, uh, you know, wow, that sounds interesting, but I don't really know what you're talking about. So yeah, that mind, body, spirit connection would be something uh, which would also be a very powerful takeaway. And it's also really what our mission with HANA is all about. It's not about this, just selling this product. We've got a, a lot of other bigger ideas that we're really focused on. And we would love to see, for example, professional athletes pushing yoga and meditation rather than energy drinks. Right. Absolutely. I'm totally on board with you there. And, you know, one of the things that I'm struggling with now is like I train and I train and I train, but I'm still gassed. And, you know, and I still don't have, I think some of it's the mental tenacity of not knowing what the limits are. And some of it's just mitochondrial function or ATP synthesis. So, you know, I've been talking Mm -hmm. with Taro about discovering some mushroom supplements. I've been talking with people about, you know, mitochondrial supplementation. I want to talk to you also about Hannah getting me on a monthly plan for that. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, figuring out like it's not all about the training of the body because I train the body nonstop and I'm still gassed at the right. end of a workout beyond what I should be. There's this whole right. thing of mental tenacity combined with, you know, the cellular level getting all the way down into your cells and saying, is everything functioning the way that it should be? Right. So, yeah, I want to ask Joel, are there any other books or uh, reading materials that you would recommend for people who want to follow in your footsteps and learn more about Ayurveda? Well, yeah, definitely. And I can also send you a list here of some books, but there's, I would say the Garrison therapy books for fasting and juicing are a must to have in your library. Right. That was the guy who like cured cancer and then had his entire practice banned in the US, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Fascinating story. It's the foundation of juicing and, you know, enemas and things like that, which is now obviously massive, you know, all over the States and, you know, these high colonics combined with juicing. And, but they're just very simple books and uh, they're focused on cancer patients mainly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But obviously you don't have to have a horrible uh, disease in order to read through these books. They're always there and I've gifted them out to so many people. So I would say that's definitely a cornerstone to have. There's the Ayurveda Encyclopedia, which is a great reference book in case you have any type of ailment or condition. And that's by Swami Sad Shiva Tirtha. It's a great book. Again, I'll send you. Yeah, we'll link it up in the blog post. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) There's a great book on Taoism and Taoism and Ayurveda, you know, India and China, very, very similar in terms of all the health stuff. There's a great, very simple book that I always carry with me. It just has a a great overview on everything from breathing exercises to dietary ideas and uh, sexual, you know, a lot of stuff in the sex world, which can be very helpful. It's called The Tao of Health, Sex and Longevity by Daniel Reed. It's basic overview of Taoism. It's very good. There's a great book that I just picked up in India, but it was released in 1969. And it's a a yoga book. It's called Asana Pranayama Mudra Banda by Sri Swami's Satyananda Saraswati. And it is the Bible of yoga poses. And it's very easy to sort of just flip through and read. and, And it just gives you a very good overview of yoga. So I would say those are some of my favorite books. Awesome. And we will link all those up. I know a lot of those names are going to be hard for people to find. So we will link them up on the blog post at becomingasuperhuman.com. Mr. Joel Einhorn, if people want to get in touch with you or learn more, where would you like us to send them? You know, How do they get in touch with you on social media, website, stuff like that? Well, hanalife.com is our website. That's H-A-N-A-H life.com. And then you can reach us at the best email would be one at hanalife.com. And we respond to every email that we receive. And we're also on Instagram 
and Facebook, the whatever you call it, the handle would be at Hannah Living. So at H A N A H Living. Awesome. And again, we will link all that stuff up in the blog post. Joel, it's been a absolute pleasure chatting with you, man. I do hope we keep in touch. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and make sure I see you at another conference soon. Are you gonna be going to summit again this year? Possibly, possibly. We're working right now with Wanderlust and we have the first. So we're, well, I don't know if you know what Wanderlust is. Wanderlust is one of the largest yoga communities in the States. And they do these six to 7,000 people events all over the United States. And their first event is in Oahu in Hawaii at the end of February. So we are kind of focused on that. And also we're working with the Tour of California, which is the cycling race. Awesome. Second biggest cycling race in the world. And that's in May. So we're a little bit uh, preoccupied. And I don't think we will. Maybe we'll make it to one of the Summit Mountain events because we're also working very closely with them. But I don't think that I will be able to just because of the sheer all of the uh, other events that are sort of coming up that we need to focus on. Rock on. Well, I hope to at least see you uh, at some event, maybe at this Biohackers Conference that's coming up or if not at Burning Man. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely <laughs> all right brother it's been a pleasure thanks for making the time hey and uh, let's touch base uh, in about a month from now all right jonathan thank you very much great to speak to you man you too take all care right. all right super friends that's it for this week's episode we hope you really really enjoyed it and learn a ton of applicable stuff that can help you go out there and overcome the impossible. If so, please do us a favor and leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or however you found this podcast. In addition to that, we are always looking for great guest posts on the blog or awesome guests right here on the podcast. So if you know somebody or you are somebody or you have thought of somebody who would be a great fit for the show or for our blog, please reach out to us either on Twitter or by email. Our email is info at becomingasuperhuman.com. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. For more great skills and strategies, or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.becomingasuperhuman.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time.